بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم All praises are Allah's Lord of the worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon our master the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate Ahlul Bayt Inshallah in the next two or three lectures a certain agenda I have in mind here, which will become apparent as we progress, and I'm using mostly from Imam's works, Imam Khomeini Rahmatullah and then this has practical benefits too, which will become more evident at, towards the end of the second and also the whole of the third lecture, inshallah. But we'll go through it slowly and see how we progress. Chapter 30, verse 7. Ya'lamuna zahiram min al-hayat al-dunya wa hum an al-akhirati hum ghafilun. They know the outer aspect of the worldly life. But they, in relation to the hereafter, they're oblivious, they're ignorant in this regard. They know the outer dimension, the external aspect of the worldly life. But there's something they don't know. Now this something which they don't know, for now the Qur'an, very in general terms, says, let's call that Akhirah. Try not to envisage your own understanding of what you've learned about Akhirah yet. But Akhir is used in opposition, opposite to this external aspect of the worldly life. The outer aspect. It's as if the Batin, the inner aspect of the worldly life, they're oblivious to. But that Batin dimension of the worldly life is referred to in general terms for now as Akhira. But these people only see the outer dimension of the worldly life. They're oblivious to the Batin, to the Butun, the plural of Batin. They're oblivious to the Butun, the esoteric dimensions, the inner meanings, inner realities of the worldly life oblivious to it. They see marriage, core marriage, that's it, in and of itself alone. They see the seminaries, core seminaries. They see studies, in and of itself studies. It's not a conduit to any higher reality. They're oblivious to the butoni aspects. They only see the dhahir. Marriage is marriage for the sake of marriage. Studies, job, university, seminary schools, core seminary schools. The Sharia, the Sharia, core Sharia, that will be evident in the third lecture in John. And everything, it's only the outer aspect they've confined themselves to. But in relation to Akhira, which is tantamount in relation to the botany, the butoon of this worldly life, whatever we see here, no, they're oblivious to that. Wahum and al akhirate hum ghafilun. So there are two points to bear in mind here. First, the worldly life has butoon, has esoteric meaning has inner aspects attached to it. Okay, that those inner aspects that Butun generally, in the language of the Qur'an, is referred to as Akhira. But then the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, which are the esoteric interpretations of the Holy Qur'an, it sheds some light, some light on what this Akhira is. So one point is that this worldly life has a button. The second is that we have to try 
and not be oblivious to it. It's explicit in the verse. It's those who are oblivious to it, it's not a good thing. They are rafil. They're oblivious to it. This is not something that we want to be. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam said, Inna awliya Allah. Oh, the saints of Allah, the disciples of Allah, the wali, awliya being the plural of wali. These saints of Allah, the disciples of Allah, those who are in annihilation in Him, those who are in unity, that divine proximity with Allah, that's the definition of a wali. These people, when Amir al Mu'mineen wants to describe them, he says, Inna awliya Allah, humul ladina. They are those who nadaru ila batin al dunya. They look at the batin of the world. Look at the esoteric interpretations of the verse of the Quran. These are words of the Ahlul Bayt. The verse said, Ya'lamuna zahira min al hayat dunya Then the verse said, but they're oblivious to the Akhirat. The terminology of the Qur'an, it's Akhirat. Now this has to be commentated upon here, the Ahlul Bayt. I'm giving the commentary. Say, look, this is the barton of the dunya. That's the goal. The awliya, they look at the barton of the worldly life. Not the job qua job. Not the seminary qua seminary. Not the wife qua wife. Husband qua husband. And so on and so forth. Not the sharia qua sharia. Not the water in the sharia qua water period. Not tayammum qua tayammum period. Keep on going. All these have butun. You just sufficed with the zahir of tayammu. You don't know what it means, the butun of it. You've sufficed with the zahir. Although it's a must, you have to do it. But it's not a must to confine yourself to that dimension. That's not a must. The must is that you have to abide by the sharia. But there's much more in this sharia that you have to explore. هُمُ الَّذِينَ نَذَرُوا إِلَى بَاطِنِ الدُّنْيَا إِذَا نَذَرَ النَّاسِ إِلَى ظَاهِرَهَا When the people, the nas, the masses, are focusing on the zahir of the dunya, the awliya, they're looking at the bottom of the dunya. There's much more to these external realities that, that, that meets the eye. So, if you're confined to the Hereha, if you're confined to this external dimension, first of all, that's not the goal. Second of all, if you remain confined, you're not progressing. And third of all, it's a minimum you've acquired. I mean, you're not going to go to hell, stuff from Allah, but I mean, it's a minimum you've acquired. So there exists Butun. And this dunya has butun, existence has butun, and even we, you, have butun. And then, although it's a bit early to mention this, but even we have butun. Plural, butun. It's not only the physical, but even the metaphysical. There are many layers within us. But the ultimate, the ultimate Botany aspect of us, Rajab Ali Borsi, or the Orafa, says that Allah said in the in the Torah, in the Bible, Allah said, and then he mentioned the Arabic, he translated it into Arabic, the lil fana, your external side is to perish, is to perish, go to be destroyed. Bartinoka, your inner dimension though, Allah is saying this, Bartinoka Anna is me. That's the ultimate. But it's all within. But that has to be explained later. 
For now, what we've tried to establish is that searching for the butun is important. It's a good lesson to take note of. And a more practical lesson is when you want to base your decisions, when you want to decide in life, when you want to make decisions in your life, it had, these decisions have to base have to be or preferably have to be based upon this reality. That is this decision of mine, this marriage, this job, this study, and so on. Is it butoon searching or not? Will it be butoon progressing or not? So searching for truth, all levels of it, all levels of truth is essential, but it's difficult. And where most of us are shackled up and oblivious to the inner dimensions of this truth. Now, Rumi has this poem. Actually, you, most of you have some command of the Farsi language now. Although I don't want to read too much of Rumi here, but there's a point here. Rumi, you know, he was a scholar in Erfan, ethics, philosophy, the Sharia, everything. It wasn't until he was a, only a poet who had no background in th these studies. And then look how Imam Khomeini praises Rumi. Ali Ghazi, Sayyid Ali Ghazi, praises Rumi. Now, Imam Khomeini, Sayyid Ali Ghazi, these aren't ordinary people. Don't, you know, put him aside too early in your lives. Don't think black and white. Great scholars have given the, even if they weren't, they had some suspicion, they always gave the benefit of the doubt. And even one, of, one Iranian poet, which I, was, which I personally, only recently, even I was a bit sidetracked, which I didn't think he had, this, there was Erfan in his works, was that of Ferdowsi. His book, Shahnameh, it's all Erfan. And I was totally oblivious to it because the style was, you know, battles and wars and everything. But every fighter, every combatter there, every war had these esoteric meanings. And this only recently I got to know. I'm very embarrassed to say that. There were two scholars speaking about it on Iranian television. I was totally bewildered. There's a reason why people, many of the Maraji, especially from before, but maybe some of them today, but like Imam Khomeini, when they started their studies at five or six years of age, they started with Sa'di. They started with these poems, the poems of the poets. These realities, these metaphysical realities which were in these poems were ingrained in them from the very beginning. Then they started. They would study Ferdowsi in their earlier years. There was a reason for that. There was a wisdom behind this. It created an Imam Khomeini and others. Anyway, Rumi the same. Most of the things you see is all traditions and the Quran in the text of a poem. Now, someone may suddenly attack and even call him names and everything, but you have to be patient. I remember when one of Ayatollah Hassanzadeh's students went to Ayatollah Sistani. Ayatollah Sistani, after the Allah said, Be patient with those who go against you. Oh. He said, Be patient. Quite a deep statement if you really look into it carefully. Now, no one is saying Rumi is 100%, of course not. No one is saying the likes of Ibn Arabi that it's 100%, out. of course not. In the houses, those who study it, the Ustads, you know, every page he gets a font from the text. Yes. But there's a lot to benefit from it too. No one is 100% in any subject. Anyway. Rumi says, Chist dunya as khuda qafil shudan. Very, very deep. What is the dunya? It's being oblivious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
That's the reality. The essence of the dunya is being oblivious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being ignorant of him. Ni qumashu nukru farzandu zan. Not the garments, not the silver, not the children, not the wife. That's not the dunya, no. That dunya which is reproached, it's nothing but being oblivious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being ghafil. That's the reality of the dunya. Now if the garments, the silverwork, make you oblivious, that's another matter. But the garments per se, is Allah's creation is good. The silverware, it's good. Women, wives, children, husbands, everything. It's all good. It's all creation. The fact that you were oblivious because of them, it's not their fault. There's something wrong within. But the dunya is nothing but the reality of it. Is being oblivious to Allah. Malra kaz bahredin bashi hamul. If you are in possession of a capital, and that this capital you are using in the way of religion, it's capital, but you're spending it in the direction of religion, ni'mamalun salihun khan dash rasul. See? He's mentioning a tradition from the Holy Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who says that if you spend in the way of religion, what a good, righteous, Mal capital this is. Pure, righteous. So capital isn't bad. The fact that it makes you oblivious to Allah, and therefore that's your dunya, the dunya within, that you've created, that's your fault. But that which is dunya by definition is being ghafil in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he continues with the poem, but I won't go through that. But the point is this, and this is quite important to absorb that according to what we've said so far, especially with this poem at the end, Akhira, the hereafter, by definition, its essence, is when the worldly attachments which makes one oblivious to Allah, this Akhira, is when the worldly attachments have decreased even if you're living in the world that's the hereafter even though you're alive awake in this world you can be in the hereafter at the same time that's the essence of the hereafter the essence of the dunya cheese dunya as qafil as khuda qafil shulam Essence of the dunya, only being oblivious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Attached to the worldly map. You only saw the hera min al hayat al dunya. Akhirah, though, what is it? When you see the batin, and as a result now, you're not attached to the the hera min al hayat al dunya. That's the akhirat. Even if you're in the dunya, you can be in akhirat. Approach is different with the Orafah here. Yeah. But the next statement is a bit more trickier. What is the dunya? <clears throat> it's when those worldly attachments are increased. Because one only sees the heramen al hayat al dunya. But here now, the stipulation where the delicate part is the dunya is when the worldly attachments are de increased. Even if you're in the hereafter, after death. Oh, this has to be explained. Maybe tomorrow we'll open this up. But just I'll try to absorb these statements for now. These are important summaries. So, the more you travel, the more you delve into, the more you explore into the Bhutan keyword, Bhutan. The more you explore into them, the more haq, the more truth will be manifested before you. But you have to go into the bottom. 
has to be part of your program. It has to be part of your life. Otherwise, no. It's going to be very, it's going to be a minimum. Now, this traveling to Haq through the Butun, it's difficult. It's very difficult. For Shias, for Sunnis, for everyone. I just want to go on the margin now, just a marginal point. In one of Ayatollah Hassan Zadi's works, Anis al Muwahideen, he lists six factors that you need these six factors to progress through the Butun and get to Haq. Now, Haq has degrees to it. But these six factors, the more you master them, the more you can travel through the Butun and get to the truth. If you don't, you won't get to the truth. If you're a Shia, you won't get to the ultimate truth. Yes, you've got the truth of Walayim to some degree, it's important. But still, the truths aren't just confined to one article of faith, especially a superficial understanding of it. If you're a Sunni, I'm just summarizing a few pages of that book for you. If you're a Sunni, if you don't, if you have these six points as a Sunni, if you master them, you will get to the truth and butun of Haq, i.e. of Shiism. Well, that's what he meant. Now, one of those true, one of those six factors, and it was the first one he mentioned, and it's only one of them I want to mention tonight, Tarkitaasso, abandoning Taasso, not sure what the translation in um, English is. It's something like, it's a form of prejudice or a form of fanaticism where you unreasonably put too much weight on a people, an ideology or something, but it's out of reason. You're defending of something. It's not reasonable. Even if it's hap, but you, you've got, you're going... It's too prejudiced your way. You're too fanatical in this aspect. Now I'll give you just two stories just for this to fall in. But Tanke Tanasop was the first he mentioned. And in the logic of the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, Tanasop is on the whole reproached. And it says those who have Tanasop, this form of fanaticism or prejudice, the, the aroma of heaven will not reach them. I mean, look, there's a reason why Ayatollah Hassan Zahadi is saying, look, this is the way to truth. You have to master these things. The first, abandon to Asso. Abandon this fanaticism. Now, this Asso actually affects many people. And unfortunately, it affects seminary students more than the common lay people. And unfortunately, it affects scholars more than the seminary students. It's something which is a disease. It's a disease which is permeating in the seminaries. Two stories. There was a scholar, there's no need to mention the name, but he has a very important book on fiqh. And he's a good scholar. I mean, he, he was an akhwari. But the book is a good book in fiqh. And in this book, he was attacking Allah Mahilli, who is one of the great scholars of Shiite history. And then he was attacking him, and there's no one attacking, maybe a, there's a reason why I'm saying attacking, but he was criticizing this one point. And this Oytolu Jawadi Ahmadi has said this in his lessons. He was attacking this one point of Allah Mahilli. And suddenly this scholar in his book, which was written many years later, after Alameli, he says, this belief that Alameli has, it entails that he is exited religion. That's ta'asob. That's gone over the top. See, that's what I mean. And that's why it's so strong amongst the scholars, amongst the seminary students. You don't have a good ustad 
you will easily fall into this trap. Especially now, you, few people are seminary students, you have to be careful. It's a reason why the Ustad has an important role. It can mold you very easily in the wrong way. You have to ask, stop, you won't grow. And this wasn't a good thing to say to the likes of, you know, Allah Mahindi. Another example, which is more contemporary, was in the Haram, there are a number of graves in the central part of the Haram, near where Shaykh Mutahari is buried. There are a number of Maharaj there. One of them is Ayatollah Muhammad Taghi Khansari. And he used to do Salat in the Fazia in Qom, the main headquarters. Next to the Fazia is Daru Shifa. I think you've all been there, I've seen it. And it was a Maghrib once, Maghrib time, and he wanted to do Salat. Some people rushed towards him and said, look, there's a fight going on in Daru Shifa. He said, what's happening? He said, let me do my salat first. He said, they're attacking one another. It's becoming physical. See, these things are, it's unfortunate. He didn't pray the Maghrib Jama'at. He said, he was so shocked at what he had, was told. He did not go ahead with the salat. He went to Daru Shifa. What the problem was in Daru Shifa, two groups were fighting one another of scholars scholars were at each other's throats one group they were cursing Mullah Sadra the other group were aggressive why are you cursing Mullah Sadra but they were aggressive they were both at fault here I don't want to take sides at all on an ethical when you look at it ethically they were both just as wrong as the other. Both of them. This is not about Mullah Sadra now, this is about Ta'assub. Mohamed Matari Khansari came, and look, as a manager, he was very strong in ethics, and he was the one who has this famous, he did, executed this famous prayer for seeking rainwater, and it actually happened many years ago. And, uh, he, um, he came and he spoke with them, to those who cursed, and he spoke to those who were becoming aggressive. He said, look, there are some people that we know, we have yaqeen, they have to be cursed. And cursing itself has meanings, but they have to be cursed. Shem, and many others, they have to be cursed. And there are many scholars that they have to be praised. It's definitive. Sheikh Mufid, Sheikh Tusi, Allah Mahili, and so on and so forth. There's no doubt. And then there are people like us in the middle. I mean, just let these people be. You don't have to curse them, you don't have to defend them like that. They're people in the middle. And it, he sorted it out, then he went and did his Maghrib prayer. But the point was this, that both those groups had ta'assub. Those who cursed, why are you cursing this scholar, this human being, who's a lover of the Ahlul Bayt, come on. Even if he did do a few mistakes, even if, I mean, everyone commits mistakes. Cursing? And then to the other group, who do you think you are attacking those people? Are you kind of defenders of Walaya? You have to speak in a much more gentle tone. And if you can't, you can't. And Maruf has, you know, different levels and priorities. At least stick to your wajibat. Ta'asub makes one exit one's religion if one doesn't be careful. When the tradition says the room of heaven won't reach them, it's an ugly reality which one is facing. Okay. <clears throat> Then, just, just, just to finish this, in Ayatollah Hassan Zali's book, he said that Al Ayatollah Allame, Rahmatullah Ali. Whenever you see Ayatollah Allame mentioned, it's referring to Allame Hindi. In Anis al Mawahideen, Ayatollah Hassan Zali said, Ayatollah Hassan Zali, when he was giving those factors, he said that Allame Hindi said, this is my own translation, 
that some people may reach the butoon of truth and believe. For example, they may, these are my own examples. They may believe in Shiism. They may believe in Wahdatul Wujud. They may believe in Mi'raj in a particular manner. But due to the circumstances surrounding society and their environment, Allah Mahdi is saying this, they couldn't express it. But they did get to the truth, but they, they couldn't express it. There are many scholars and there are many theories given, and many, even people like Imam Fakhr al Razi. Many people believe he was Shia, which is incredible. I mean, Ibn Arabi with Mawlavi with, and others, it's more, it's easier to understand. But with some, it's very difficult. In Shahid Awal and the likes of him, like Shahid Awal, Shahid Sani, these people, when they wrote books of fear, they would always write all the schools of Islam in their books. The rulings in relation to all of them. When it came to Shiism, it was all done in private. I think it was Shaita Awal. Lum'e, not the commentary, the Lum'e itself, the main text, he wrote it in prison. And if these books hadn't come out, people like even Shaita Awal, there would have been some question mark. It was different, the environment was different then. But it did come out when he was martyred. If it came out, it was martyred. It wasn't the freedom that we have today, here. Today, taqiyya is in relation to another thing. It's not in relation to studies as it was in those days. Anyway, okay, coming back to now the main point that was just on the margin. So the goal is attainment to the butoon. It's a goal. It's important, it's significant. Now, Imam Khomeini, he writes in his Adab al-Salat, a very good book. It's a manual of Sufism. There's no doubt about it. A manual that, where Imam has described his tariqah in these 300, 400 pages. Adab al-Salat. A lot of realities are there. Been translated into English, but it's difficult to maybe grasp it. But it's in Farsi, the original language. And that's why you know, learning Farsi, it, it, even if you learn only Farsi to understand this book, you've progressed a lot. He writes in this book, <clears throat> the truth, this is my own translation, so it may be erroneous in parts, but the message, the main message, and I'll, I'll highlight that ultimate, the, the main line, but I'm, I'm, I'm translating one or two paragraphs, but the main line, I will highlight it when we come to it. The truth of the Qur'an, the truth of the Qur'an, the mother of the book, is tahrif-less. Tahrif, the understanding that we have of tahrif, means distortion. But that's only the external understanding of tahrif. When the Qur'an, for example, the words, the meanings have been distorted. That's the comment. We don't believe that the words of the Quran have been distorted at all. That's the external tahrif, which we say it hasn't happened. That's one meaning of tahrif. Imam is bringing another meaning of tahrif, a deeper meaning. He's saying that the truth of the Qur'an, that mother of the book, that immaterial, abstract reality, if you want Allah's knowledge, is tahrifless. It can't be distorted. I mean, not the tahrif that we know of words, physical words in a book, in a physical book. Tahrif here, it can't be distorted at all in the absolute sense. And it's unchangeable. The Qur'an, the, the physical Arabic Qur'an that we have, is changeable. We have verses which abrogate others. Even this doesn't exist in the mother of the book. It's unchangeable. From this divine book of revelation, that ultimate essence of the Qur'an, no one can bear it but 
the likes of the existence of the absolute wali, like Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam. Others cannot grasp the ultimate truth. They can't. It's too deep, it's too immaterial, complex. Especially for people who are absorbed in this world, they can't reach that ultimate truth. Others can't grasp this ultimate truth, save were it, that ultimate truth, to manifest from the unseen realm of existence to the apparent visible realm, where it becomes physical words in an Arabic, in an Arabic Quran. Save if it were to manifest in this realm, only then can we see it. Evolving down to the physical realm, manifesting to them, clothed, very delicate word, eloquently mentioned, clothed with the clothes of words and worldly letters. The ultimate truth, only if it were to evolve and manifest down, realm of existence come down, descending one after the other, until it becomes clothed with worldly letters. That ultimate immateriality is now clothed in, clothed in um, words, in you know, letters. Only then we have some access. This is one of the meanings of Tahrif. What he's trying to say is, when that ultimate truth, when it manifests and descends to a less immaterial reality, Tahrif has, ar has arisen. It's become distorted. Not distorted in the negative sense. Like what we say in, in Fiqh. Not that tarif in the Sharia. But that ultimate truth, it's manifested, it's come down to a lower level. That's tarif. Then it comes down to another level. That's more tarif. Until it becomes, comes down and clothed into worldly letters. A lot of stages of distortion, spiritual distortion, has arisen. This is one of the meanings of tahrif that occurs with respect to all the Qur'an and all the noble verses have undergone such a tahrif or numerous tahrifs all the verses of the Qur'an have undergone this spiritual distortion before being accessible to the masses before being accessible to me and you, since we are worldly and we only understand worldly realities, it had to go through many stages of tahrif, distortion, till it became easy for me and you to read the words and letters. <clears throat> the number of levels of tahrif is on a par to the dot is on a par with the number of levels of butoon of the Qur'an. The number of levels of tahrif depends on the butoon of the Qur'an. How many layers does the Qur'an have? How many dimensions does the Qur'an have? In some traditions, إِنَّ لِلْقُرْآنِ ذَهْرًا وَبَتْنَا وَلِبَتْنِهِ بَتْنَا إِلَى سَبْعَةَ أَبْتُمْ Early with the Qur'an, there's a dahir and there's a batin. In this batin, it has another batin, seven times over. In some traditions, it says 70 times over. How many butun does the Quran have? That's the number of tahrif which happens. The number of levels of tahrif is on a par to the dot with the number of levels of butun of the Quran. In short, Tahrif is dissension from the absolutely unseen realm to the absolutely, absolutely apparent realm. In proportion to the levels of realms of existence. Should, that should now be evident after you know, explaining what Imam was saying. That's Tahrif. Coming down one level after the other. But this is where the, the important point is. This sentence. And Butun... Now, Imam is giving the definition. And the butun 
is the return from the absolutely apparent, the Dahir, to the absolutely unseen. The more the Salik, Imam says, the traveler, ascends, the more he is freed from such ta'rif. Very important. And then Imam, in his tafsir of Surah Al-Hamd, in that tafsir, he says, the awliya, the saints, the disciples of Allah, they can't explain their mushahadat, mukashafat. They can't explain their, their unveilings and their visions that they have. They can't explain it to the masses. They can't. If they try to do it, things will become messed up. They just can't do it. Like, I'm almost saying this. Like with the Quran, like with the Quran, which has descended to such, has descended so much to the extent that it addresses people who are imprisoned by the shackles of darknesses, just like the Quran. The, the Holy Prophet couldn't explain the, re, the essence of the book to the people. In the same way, the Oliya, they can't explain their unveilings. The Quran was the unveiling of the Holy Prophet. He can't explain it. That's why the Quran, the ultimate truth, had to descend so much, so much, till it comes to a language that people understand. In the same way, the awliya, when they have these visions, when they have these mushahadat, these witnessings, these unveilings, they can't explain it to the people. Unless they explain it in a very, very simple language. Like with the Quran. Then Imam says, it's incredible, the hands and tongue of the Holy Messenger were tied behind, behind his back. This is a code. With this code, and Imam actually mentions it in a minute. It's a code. Only now you can understand many stories of the Quran. We'll come to it in a minute. The hands and the tongue of the Holy Messenger, they were tied behind his back. They can't reveal that which is reality. People like the Holy Messenger, they can't reveal. Save by manifesting it, descending it to a lower level. The Quran, Imam says, has degrees. Seven Butun or seventy Butun exist for the Quran, referring to those two traditions. From these Butun, the Quran has descended so low so that it can address, speak to the masses. And then Imam says, consequently, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has introduced himself with the camel. Afalo yanduruna ilal ibili kayfa khuniqat. Do they see the camel and how it was created? And this, Imam says, is greatly, remarkably regretful for us, i.e., to attain to his ma'rafa, Allah's ma'rafa, through these lowly existing beings, or via the sama, via the earth, via man, and so on and so forth. It's greatly regretful. He's saying the ultimate truth had to come so low so that we get to have ma'rafa of Allah through the camel. Because we are so lowly. And if we stay and confine to this lowliness, well, you know the conclusion. Then Imam says, the tongue of the prophets had knots with a K. Uqdatan millisani. The tongue of the prophets had knots. Rabbi Shahli, Sadri, Wayasirli, Amri, Wahlul, 
اقتم مد لسانی This the knot of my tongue, let it open, go loose, untie it, O oh Allah. This is quoting Nabi Musa alayhi salam. And then we suddenly we come across traditions which are which are Israeliyat without a doubt. My people are sh- having doubt in this, I'm not sure. Which say that when he was a child, as a punishment, he had to they put hot stones or whatever in his mouth and from then on he had this problem this staccato in, in his speech and they, they took they took this knot in their tongue as literal and now I can't do it and I need my brother now I just can't do it is that the status of a prophet these people who say that they haven't understood the the butoon of what it means to be a prophet their understanding of Nabuwa is compromised. It's a minimum at best. I'm not saying they're going to hell, no. I'm just saying it's a minimum. But here Imam opened this up. They can't speak the truth. They can't speak to the masses like that. The tongue is tied in the spiritual sense. Other Urafa have explained that. that Nabi Musa Islam, he said this after seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then out of immense what in the world he is. After seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He couldn't now go and speak with a low life like Pharaoh. He was embarrassed. He was embarrassed to go to such a person. He was in the presence of Allah, speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was his knot. How can he go and speak with this low life after speaking with Allah? He was embarrassed to do it. I can't. That's another understanding. But it wasn't a physical problem. The knots were, Imam continues, the knots were, this is in Tafsir Surah al the knots were in their tongue, not in their hearts. They could not express that which they were spiritually in possession of to others, and hence they would utter through analogies and examples. He, he didn't mention this verse, but there is a verse in the Quran. These are examples we are giving to the people. But people won't understand it except those people of knowledge. It's just examples, a conduit to deeper things. And Imam ends by saying in this part of the book, anyway, when Allah is being introduced by a camel, it is but evident what level we are residing in. It's the animalistic level. And the ma'rifa that we do acquire is very deficient unless we rise. And then there's another verse of the Holy Quran. وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا This world to life is nothing but إِلَّا لَهْوٌ وَلَعِبٌ It's diversion and play. It's all Allah-less. From the school, to marriage, to children, to the job. For most people it's all diversion and play. وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَحِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ the abode of the hereafter. Okay, hereafter used in general terms, the butun. That's real life. That is true life. Lahi al That is the true life. Akhara. But you can acquire that here. But you have to go through the butun. You have to make an effort. You have to endeavor. But all your life, if it was butun less, 
and you suffice with the dunya, the out aspect, it's just all la walayat. Be it in the seminary, be it in an in industry, job, marriage, whatever. The next issue is this dunya, Imam in 40 hadith, he has a good um, one or two paragraphs here explaining the dunya. It's on page 139 in this translation. But Imam says, this pauper says, this faqir says, the dunya may sometimes be regarded as meaning the lowest level of existence and the abode of change, transition, and annihilation. The akhirah signifies return from this low mode of existence to the higher, see, butun, to the higher celestial plane, one's inner world, which is the abode of permanence, stability, and eternity. These two worlds exist for every individual. The first one is the terrestrial realm of development and emergence, which is the lower plane of observable worldly existence. The other is the hidden, inward, and celestial realm of existence, which is the higher plane of being of the hereafter. Although worldly existence is a lower and defective realm of being, but since it's a nursery for the training of lofty souls and the school for acquiring higher spiritual stations, it is a field for cultivating the hereafter. It's for cultivating the hereafter. You cultivate the butun in this world. That's why the world is here. And that's why we started here. In the dunya, mazra'atun akhirah. The world is the hereafter's farmyard. And this is one of the esoteric interpretations of Sirat al-Rahim. Maintaining family relations. That's, the Sharia has one meaning. The Urak one of six or seven. One of them is the world is the Rahim. This physical world is the Rahim. Maintain relations with it as it should be. It's your cultivating ground for the hereafter. It's your route to the Butun. It's your ticket to the salvation. Right here. Don't look for it over there. In this sense, it is the dunya, it's the most sublime of the realms of being and the most profitable of worlds for the lovers of God and the wayfarers of the path of the hereafter. And were it not for this terrestrial realm of matter, the domain of physical and spiritual substantial transformation and change, and if God Almighty had not made it a realm of transition and annihilation, not a single imperfect soul would have attained its promised state of perfection nor would it have been able to reach the realm of permanence and stability, nor the embodiments of imperfection would have been able to enter the kingdom of God. Accordingly, that which is mentioned in the Qur'an and tradition regarding the reproaching of the dunya, when you see the Qur'an, when you see the traditions reproaching the dunya, it does not actually apply to the world itself. That's all good, that's creation but is meant to refer to absorption in it and love and attachment for it. This shows that man has two worlds. One of them is condemned, while the other is extolled and praised. See, page 139, under the section of the author's view. It's in the beginning of the sixth hadith, love of the world. And then, Imam, I will just end with this and then we'll just read a few words of Mosiba. In his commentary of Du'a'i Sahar, which is a very important du'a, usually we read it in the month of Ramadan. Here he says, try to maintain you know, the spinal column of the discussion, it's the Butun, it's all about the Butun here. So, O needy one, endeavor in the name of your Lord and purify your heart and exit from Satan's influence and recite your Lord's book and ascend. Read it, your Lord's book is within. It can apply to the physical Quran too. 
with deliberation and thought and do not become confined within its shell. Oh, since Imam is mentioning this, I have the audacity to use this word shell. It's an incredible word to use. Don't, and don't become confined within the book's shell, the external aspect of it, and external dimension. Don't imagine that the divine book and the revealed lordly Qur'an is nothing but the shell and the outer aspect. Don't imagine that. It's wrong. Why? Emon says, because confining oneself to the outer dimension and being mu'takif, you know, you've all heard of the Sharia's i'takaf, the spiritual retreatment for three days, because confining oneself to the outer dimension and being mu'takif, retreating to, in alam al-zahir, the outer, the external realm, and not transgressing to the essence and the batin, is tantamount to death. You're dead. You don't go to the bottom, you're dead. Confined to the head of the world, you're dead. Spiritually dead. It's tantamount to death, to destruction, and to the bases of all forms of ignorance. And then he continues. Inna dar al-akhirati lahi al Many people are dead. Right now they're dead in this world. Because they've never striven towards the Bhutan. Any level of the Bhutan. They didn't even make an effort. In, in chapter 50 verse 22, Verily you were oblivious to this. Minhada meaning either according to the text of the verses around this verse, either you are oblivious to the fact that the real life is in the hereafter, which now you understood to mean Bhutan, or you are oblivious to the fact that all the, the, this world, the people who were here, they were dead. You were oblivious to this death. You were oblivious to it. And then it continues. Inshallah, we'll continue with this tomorrow, inshallah. With your permission, in these days, we're trying to respect the holy, her, her holiness, Lady Fatima.